I guess it takes uh, uh, a lot to become a high representative, and I'm sure you will prove it now. I think you have something like uh, <laughs> 37 questions, but please go ahead. You can, you're free to choose. Feel free to choose. It's very dangerous. I'll try to be uh, as quick as possible. I speak fast. Now, uh, I start from the question that you're afraid uh, can, be, uh, can be left uh, out. Uh, does the EU care more for stability than for democracy and the issue of Bosnia and Herzegovina? I refuse completely uh, to get into the narrative of stability versus democracy because there is no stability sustainable <laughs> without democracy. And there is no democracy for real if you don't have a stable environment. And the Western Balkans are the best, best, best demonstration of that. When it comes to Bosnia and Herzegovina, I have to correct you. I have to correct you because what I've seen as a minister for some months and before from behind, from outside more than from behind, is that we have had years where the process was stalling. We've had a renewed process where we didn't put a paper in front of the authorities of Bosnia and Herzegovina. We put a proposal of approach a new approach, a different approach. We start from a different thing, which is social and economic reforms for the benefit of the people, and then we move also to the other things, which we know you authorities don't like to tackle. But at least, let's start from that. Instead of from starting from A and then moving to B, let's start from B and then move to A, knowing that we have to do both at the end of the process, which was not a piece of paper, which was an approach, a philosophy. It took them a couple of months to digest it, from end of November to January, and then they produced the famous paper themselves, they voted, they endorsed it, and they are now taking, yeah, the written agreement that was uh, uh, voted in Parliament, I was present there on that day uh, by all, and then it took a little bit more than expected in terms of months to digest it and to come up with a coordination mechanism and, uh, and the reform agenda to be implemented. True, five months instead of two, F true. But we've had before that years of nothing. So before changing against the strategy, I would be counting not to 10, not to 100, but to 1,000, because I see it's moving. Is it moving? Slow? Yes. Is it moving with many difficulties and contradictions? Yes, yes, yes. But it's moving, and I would not change or rechange strategy now, not even one year after that, while in these months it has produced some move. Um, and I, uh, I'm sorry, but another thing I refuse is uh, the uh, reference to carrots and sticks. First of all, because we are not animals, uh, we are um, human beings and, uh, uh, and, and, and states. Uh, and I think it is the wrong approach. Carrots and sticks uh, is the approach of the croissant uh, given to the poor guy uh, going to help uh, the nice uh, girl uh, on mathematics. Uh, if, if we say that this is a process that can benefit and does benefit both the European Union and the accession countries, it's not about carrots and sticks to me. It's about moving together into a positive or into a negative direction. This brings us to the big, big question. Will the European Union be ready if all the accession countries, or even if one accession country will be ready? This is our part of the credibility story to build. This requires a narrative uh, building on our side very much. Here I bring my personal political view, which is very much that European Union needs to go on on enlargement. First of all, uh, you are not the only one thinking of Greece all the time. Greece is in the Western Balkans somehow. Uh, and if we have still countries in the Western Balkans and in Turkey, even if in its own way, uh, willing to come in, with the difficult times that European Union is living inside, I would thank, I don't believe in God, so otherwise I would thank God, but anyway, I would say we have to invest in this, because the fact that European Union is attractive, 
is something that still is a model and has a transformative power, not only institutionally, but in a society, we have to invest in it. If we don't get it right in the next four years, we're going to lose it forever, forever, if it's not too late. I hope it's not too late, <laughs> otherwise I wouldn't be investing so much in this, but it's the last chance. So I think European Union, all of it, institutions and member states together, need to move on on the enlargement as much as the accession countries does, do. Uh, but it needs to be prepared politically. Uh, that's why I think, I think that the, the narrative of the freeze is not the right one for us. First of all, for inside the European Union. It's reassuring, but it's not pushing. Um, Russia is setting the agenda. We are only reacting. What is our strategy? This, to me, links to the question uh, uh, that uh, Gia was asking, how do we deal with actors that don't believe in cooperation? Uh, and also the question that was asked about uh, Iran. I think the three questions are linked because when I say Europe nature, Europe's nature and the European foreign policy nature is uh, building cooperation, that's exactly what I mean. It's a strategy that requires patience, determination, Unity, uh, ambition, vision, uh, a lot of patience, first of all. Uh, five years ago, if you asked in a similar setting if it was possible to get an agreement with Iran, with Ahmadinejad in power and uh, the regional setting, everybody would have not bet one single cent, being it of dollar or euro, on this. Still, we are here, uh, not so many years after. Obviously, if you measure results of foreign policy in terms of weeks or months, you don't need a strategy then. But I think that is exactly the way in which we can build strategies. Then if you ask me if we had a strategy on Russia when we were going through the crisis we have at the past, not sure. But I think that that is the possible way. And yes, we reached the agreement with Iran, not in spite of Russia, but also thanks to Russia, yes. Clearly so, clearly so. Also because I think Russia wanted to show that it can be a responsible or useful player on other tables. Is this a possible way of, one, trying to re-engage Russia in the international community with the rules of the international community? Could be. Is this a way to build regional or international frameworks that helps us solving the Syrian crisis? Someone was asking about Syria. Uh, if that is a, you were asking about Syria at the beginning, if that is a, uh, a failure. Uh, if you don't build the conditions for regional and international frameworks that allow cooperation and crisis management and crisis um, at the end to overcome crisis, uh, then you don't have that kind of, uh, of thing. But if you invest in processes with the patience and with the um, determination, uh, then sometimes results come. And Iranian deal show us that yes, multilateralism, diplomacy, and international cooperation can bring results. Um, so I think this is the way forward. And Cyprus is another, uh, who was asking about Cyprus? You didn't. <laughs> you didn't speak. Uh, you, were, you were asking. I'm, I'm, I'm going there tonight uh, to keep, uh, to keep the, uh, the investment in a process that, yes, can be a game changer in the region, can be a game changer in the Middle East, as well as the Iranian deal can be a, a big game changer in the Middle East. And we have to invest in game, I'm not sure it's a correct English, but game, changing, uh, game changer uh, dynamics. Uh, and one reinforces, can reinforce the other. I think this is the only strategy we can have. Um, building frameworks for, frameworks for cooperation. Um, I have many other points. Uh, I will keep, uh, I will take a, a couple of them. Um, you asked about uh, uh, involving uh, accession countries in policy definition. This is something I've been insisting on from the very first day of my mandate, especially when we use another word that is terrible, alignment. You can ask 
sovereign states to align to policies they have not been, I don't say contributed to, but even involved in the definition of or, or, or discussed. So the more we discuss before, the better it is and the easiest it is then to be united afterwards. This is true for the accession countries. This is true for the European Union. Because the, the issue of unity that you raised, obviously, I mean, we still have different narratives, we still have different visions, we still have different priorities. I think it will be impossible to be really united and have a really one foreign and security policy in the European Union if we don't shape it together from the very beginning. If we shape it in Brussels, closed in, uh, you refer to the ES, please don't. I mean, that's my, that's my, uh, that's my uh, machine, uh, but it's not ES or another institution in Brussels. I mean, that's, the European Union is not one building in Brussels. It's, it's all around the place. Uh, and if we don't build our policies all together, taking into consideration from the very beginning the viewpoints of the different capital cities, and not only of governments, but also of societies, think tanks, parliaments, uh, the foreign policy community, then we will never speak with one voice. I still believe that our aim is not speaking with one voice, but singing the same song with many different voices, because that's much more powerful. But still, at least we have to agree on the, on, on the song and fine-tuning, because otherwise it, it, it's terrible. Uh, but this is a process that needs to be built, uh, not having something that comes out of the blue and, and that's it, and you sign it. It doesn't work like that. Uh, but I think that we have a common ground of common interest, a common European interest in foreign policy, which is, I think, the basis for having a real European foreign policy. And I think that the Ukrainian crisis has shown it in a perfect way. Not one single member state, even the one that is going to have a referendum in a little bit uh, on uh, uh, staying or not staying, would have had any possible instrument to face uh, the Ukrainian crisis and relations with Russia alone. Sanctions by one member state is nothing. Sanctions at 28 is powerful. So I think that apart from the narrative that we have and we are uh, affectionate too. We, we like, we, we, we factionated that. Uh, we're used to it, to use it, that we are divided. In the end of the day, we are much less divided than we think, uh, if you see the results. Uh, and I think we should also uh, be a little bit more proud of our, uh, of our united um, policies. Um, I don't uh, go into the, um, the energy thing, because that would require uh, a session itself, and I guess you have it. Uh, uh, I would be more than happy to be in that session as well. Uh, but indeed, that is either a major problem or a major tool. And it, it's up to us Europeans to shape it in a way that it's a major tool. It is possible, especially working on all the different, you know, uh, we've been talking before about the different routes that bring to Europe refugees. We also have different routes uh, of energy supplies from Africa uh, to the Americas uh, to Asia. Uh, but without one single European approach, it's simply not going to happen. It's, it's simply not going to happen. And here we need uh, to develop that, uh, which is not the case uh, necessarily at the moment. And uh, on the foreign policy dimension of our relations uh, with the Western Balkans, I'm completely convinced that this is part of our work with the Western Balkans. Not, on, not only with the Western Balkans, also with Turkey. Uh, because we have this thing that as it is accession countries, it's only accession countries. No, it's also partners. It's also countries of the region. Uh, it's, the accession uh, path is not the only dimension of our relation. Uh, it's the main one, probably, uh, but it's not the only one, also because we share a lot of uh, uh, challenges in the region. But for what concerns the foreign policy strategy, um, four pages in 2004, that's another word, but the European Union security strategy, it's more than four pages, but still 2003, so that's why we're working at that. We had a very good strategy. The Solana one was great, I think, but uh, we're working on, uh, on renewing it. And it would be interesting to share that kind of process 
uh, with the Western Balkan uh, countries and with Turkey as well. Thanks. Thank you very much. This is also our uh, the exercise part of part of the reason why we're doing ex this exercise is to get the input of all these very very smart people around this table uh, into the. Uh, 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 your, your, your team's uh, thinking of the global strategy. We're going to send you the results of this meeting and the next uh, two sessions. Uh, and uh, I hope you find it as, uh, uh, as useful for us. Uh, it was a great honor and a great pleasure to have you. We're going to let you go to your meeting with the president. And I'm going to ask our Bulgarian uh, participants to stay for a couple of closing wor uh, words. But thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. And as I anticipated, I learned a lot also from the questions. And thank you very much for that. I really appreciate it. That's my usual uh, window of uh, breathing. Uh, I like also the official uh, meetings. <laughs> but this format is something I enjoy very much. I thank you very much for that. Ms. Kutneva, very briefly, if you want to uh, maybe touch on, on the issues that were not covered by Ms. Mugherini. I, I, I appreciate very much the, the question, and I, I feel really the question is important of Daniel Smilov about the readiness of the Union. Of course, uh, uh, such a topic is, is very important for, for all of us, neighborhood policy enlargement. Actually, this is the future of the Union. All the time we are talking about the future of, of the Union. Uh, ever closed Union or ever closer Union or enlarged Union or stay as, as it is for, well, I don't know how many years. Uh, I like what you said, imagine. But imagine is a matter of, well, a spirit, even a title of a beautiful song, but uh, not entirely possible for rea real politic. There is no imagine. There is financial framework. There is milk quota. Actually, there will be no any more milk quota. Uh, that is about competitiveness. Uh, it's also about uh, state aid. Terrible, terrible question about state aid. It's about uh, uh, are you used to shoot birds, like this one turned to be the biggest question in Malta, or you might name a lot of cultural differences, which are playing also an important role when, uh, when you, uh, you negotiate, like kind of a, you agree or disagree with bullfighting. Uh, so I don't think that the union right now is... Uh, Mm, at least not institutionally and financially ready for the next enlargement within the next four years. But I very much hope, and yes, I can, I can imagine that this one might happen. I also would like to say that Bulgarian presidency in 2018, when actually the first talk about uh, the uh, financial framework will start, uh, might be very instrumental in uh, pushing the debate uh, in a very sincere way. What is possible? What kind of a union uh, we, we, will be, we will belong to? Because let us don't forget that we, we talk about the, the UK problem, that there might be some changes. What kind of union, really? Uh, there will be, of course, a lot of questions about free movement of people, a lot of questions about uh, social benefits uh, and not just and only because of, uh, of UK. So uh, this, is, this is the shortest possible answer to your question and uh, uh, I believe that our friends and colleagues around the table uh, will understand that this is a process uh, there are no miracles, but count on uh, on uh, many Europeans, including Bulgarian Europeans, that that we really see the union as an enlarged union. 
which most probably change agricultural policy with uh, um, other policies which should be should be changed. I'm not going to list all of all of them. Maybe regional policy also. Maybe how we use cohesion funds a lot. And also, uh, we prepare right now the ground for such kind of a, of a, I hope, bright future. And it is all about economy right now, about how Europe will be ready to get out of this, of this uh, uh, not, not just financial crisis, which I hope is more or less solved, but uh, Greece is also a big, uh, a big test for, for us. So there is no simple answers. <laughs> Minister Mitov, your final words. There were a couple of uh, uh, pointed questions also to you, if you want to pick uh, one or the other of them, but uh, we will try to wrap up, maybe. Well, yes, and I'll try to be short. Uh, and just address several, so, several of the questions which are really interesting, and one of the most interesting uh, questions was the choice between stability and democracy. Uh, well, that's a that's a permanent dilemma, and I think this is uh, this is the dichotomy which has brought us to so many disasters that uh, we we probably don't even realize. Um, it's about it, it's a little bit like the chicken and the egg, uh, as it was mentioned already. There's no democracy uh, without stability, and vice versa. But uh, we cannot allow ourselves anymore to neglect our values or to close our eyes. Um, in the Middle East and North Africa, the Arab Spring, um, that's, that's my, my perception, um, happened and also took an anti-Western turn in certain countries because of the fact that we, for decades, preferred stability and we neglected the a lot of the atrocities that were happening there under certain regimes. Um, I speak about Mubarak, I, I speak about, uh, about others, Gaddafi and so on, we, we, we know them all. Um, stability could be only temporary if there's, no, if there's no sustainable and clear uh, path towards the assertion of certain democratic values. There's no way, or it will be the stability of a graveyard, as, as a smart German journalist a year or two ago defined this type of stability. Stability under which there's nothing, no substance, it's, it's oppression, it's lack of freedom, it's lack of uh, respect of human rights, it's lack of transparency, there's corruption and so on. So that's not that's not stability. That will blow up in our faces someday. So we cannot prefer that stability to, uh, to the, the assertion uh, of, of um, certain values and democracy in general. Uh, Russia is setting the agenda. Well, that's very true. They are. But the, the destructive agenda is always stronger than the positive one. When you want to destroy something, it is much easier. It is easier. But when we need to realize that we need to defend ourselves. When, when we fully realize that, then we can turn the trend and start actually uh, setting the agenda. Have we realized that we are under, under threat? Not military threat. Threat, hybrid threat. We have defined it already. You know what it means. Everyone knows what it means. Uh, so that's... That is the, the whole question, and I have to say, strategy still needs to be developed. I, I know that little by little we are realizing what the threats are, but strategy is still in, in progress, let's put it this way. Russia does not believe in win-win, but rather zero-sum. Well, yeah, I, I can completely agree, and I think during the, the, the short intervention I somehow tried to, uh, to actually um, give a hint towards that as well. Um, so we, we, need to, we need to somehow realize that on the other side there's, there's something which is not uh, sharing any type of, of, maybe not any type, but is not sharing very fundamental principles 
uh, on which our societies are based. So, and our international relations are based on those. So that is why we need to, to realize that the approach needs to be a little, bit, a little bit different. Yes, we need to keep open channels. Yes, Iran, the Iran deal was uh, possible because of Russia. There's no doubt about that. Um, when it comes to Syria, when it comes to other issues, for sure we will need to, to work with Russia. But that doesn't mean that the win-win uh, the approach has been um, achieved. That doesn't mean that the, the, the threat is not there. In, in our in our own uh, homes, and w when it comes to f fragile democracies like Bulgaria or like the the new um, the new wave of enlargement countries, well, we are much more vulnerable than anyone else. The energy union that's another another thing, and I will close with with that. Even if I I, I would like to uh, touch upon the other things, but the energy union is one very important thing. Federica said there needs to be a uh, united approach. And that's very true. That's exactly what we need to do. The energy union depends on us as European Union. Whether I will be uh, inclined to include Turkey, yes, of course. But I'm not really sure, that, sure whether our Turkish friends and colleagues want that. They have a different approach in this, uh, in this situation. Uh, so if they, if they want to be part of it, well, that's a, that's a very good thing. I would be the first one to embrace it. I'm not really sure whether they want it. Um, but our energy uh, union needs to be based on, on several principles. First, we, we need to answer the question whether we will allow Russia to circumvent Ukraine when it comes to gas supplies. That's a fundamental question which we need to answer. Second, if the answer is no, then we need to know that all of us need to, be, to stop being gullible to bluffs and stop signing MOUs left and right, because they are only used in order to divide us and, and to um, seed, um, seed the feeling that we are played against each other. And it's not only a feeling, uh, that, is, that is actually happening. Um, but, but that needs to be uh, still defined in the, in the, in the energy, um, let's say, in, in the energy environment of the European Commission. But my, a lot of, the foreign minister's positions is exactly that. So I think we can finally achieve certain type of agreement around, around the approach. If we do that, from then on it will be much easier. Uh, electricity, yeah, that's another market, energy market, which, need, which needs to be integrated. Uh, so that's, uh, those are the final remarks. I can, I can continue, but don't want to be, uh, and key points, uh, diversification and intercon interconnectivity. Diversification, extremely important. Other sources of gas, other sources, uh, and, and possibility for gas to flow east, west, uh, vice versa, and of course, uh, north, south, and vice versa. Well, that's, that's very shortly uh, what, what I wanted to just to, to stress upon. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would also invite you to, to thank uh, Minister Mitov and Deputy Prime Minister Kuneva for this. We are going to continue immediately with the Western Balkans panel. Uh, and I promise you, if you finish by quarter past six, there will be coffee. Thank you very much.